thank you very much for those who are interested in this topic to be here and to have uh, and, and to come and listen to this specific subspecialty topic, which is the cataract surgery and visual rehabilitation in AMD patients. It is organized by the European Academy of Ophthalmology and it is Professor Andrei Grybowski who organized this session. He is also the first speaker of this uh, session this afternoon. And I'm very happy to invite him and to give his talk. Dear chairs, dear colleagues, but I think uh, I need the help because uh, there is not uh, our session here. Um, is there anybody from the service to help us? Can you send can you send the presentations for this session? This is another talk from oh, yeah, the previous yeah, yeah, session. Uh, wait. Okay. So I will speak about the cataract surgery in AMD patients and. Uh, Try to answer some of our questions here by financial disclosures. None of them is relevant to the topic of this uh, presentation. So the first question, does cataract surgery influence AMD progression? This is the major question we have uh, before the surgery. Uh, there, there were two theoretical mechanisms proposed, one uh, involving blue light toxicity and the other inflammation. As we know, ultraviolet or blue light is known to cause macular phototoxicity. And uh, after cataract surgery, this natural filter is replaced with a clear lens implant that provides less protection against ultraviolet light. Um, it led to the development and clinical use of yellow tinted, so blue blocking IOLs. However, there is no evidence today that supports the use of blue blocking IOLs for the prevention of AMD, even there is still a discussion about that. And the another mechanism is about inflammation. Uh, we are quite aware that uh, specifically immune dysregulation involving the alternative complement pathway play a key role in the pathogenesis of AMD, and that Inflammation induced during uncomplicated cataract surgery could tip the balance to a disease development or progression. We are quite aware about such a complication after cataract surgery, like a post-cataract cystoid macular edema. So it was likely more plausible in the early days of cataract surgery when uh, extra capture, uh, cataract extraction was the pro pro pre predominant technique. Today it's much less invasive, but still, of course, it produces some uh, uh, in, um, inflammation. Uh, earlier cross-sectional studies reported an increased risk of late AMD after cataract surgery. Studies from 2002, 2006, Beaver Dam Eye Study, Blue Mountains Eye Study, uh, they um, uh, provided uh, such a, um, uh, results. But the recent cross-sectional studies from Korea and Australia have failed to report the same studies from uh, 2016, as you see from JAMA Ophthalmology and Ophthalmology Journal. Uh, there is some evidence from a cohort studies, uh, especially ARETS. ARETS report 25 assessed the risk of advanced AMD after cataract surgery in more than 8,000 eyes and showed no clear effect. Then ARETS report 27 reported a statistically significant gain in visual acuity after cataract surgery in all AMD levels. And ARETS 2 report 5 
found significant visual acuity gains across all AMD severity groups after cataract surgery. What about meta-analysis? There are two uh, which are relevant to the subject. One which was published 2015 in Acta Ophthalmologica. It was a systemic review and meta-analysis of two randomized control trials and two case control studies. And it showed that uh, moderate quality of evidence to suggest that visual acuity is better by approximately seven letters in eyes with AMD that underwent cataract surgery versus eyes with AMD that did not undergo cataract surgery for up to 12 months after surgery. And the same quality of evidence did not find an increased risk of progression to exudative AMD for at least 12 months after surgery. Another meta-analysis, another, this is the Cochrane analysis uh, published last year, uh, based again on the same two RCTs. They evaluated the effectiveness and safety of cataract surgery compared with no surgery, nice with AMD included, as I mentioned, two RCTs with a total of 140 participants with visually significant cataract and AMD. And they concluded that it was not possible to draw real, reliable conclusions from the available data as to whether cataract surgery is beneficial or harmful in people with AMD after 12 months. Cataract surgery provides short-term, six-month improvement in best corrected visual acuity in eyes with AMD compared with no surgery. It is unclear whether the timing of surgery has an effect on long-term outcomes. Well, there are a few retrospective studies uh, hmm, devoted to this subject. One of them, a uh, retrospective cohort study with two groups of patients, both undergoing treatment with anti-VGF agents for active wet AMD. And they, uh, they uh, noted three months after cataract surgery that surgical eyes had significantly better vision compared to the control group. There was no statistically uh, significant difference in the number of, of injections received by the surgical and non-surgical groups, both before and after cataract surgery. And, there was a significant difference in the final mean central foveal thickness with surgical eyes measuring a mean of 265 micrometers and non-surgical eyes measuring a mean of 216 micrometers. It was uh, statistically significant, the difference. And they also noted that in surgical eyes, uh, they had more new or worse intraretinal cysts on OCT suggesting a potential subclinical susceptibility to post-operative cystoid macular edema or CNV exacerbation. Another study published last year in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, retrospective study to investigate whether the preoperative presence of macular fluid on OCT in eyes with uh, neovascular AMD affected visual acuity following cataract surgery and they noted an improvement in best corrected visual acuity at both four to six weeks and six months post-operatively. However, uh, they also noted uh, that uh, nearly 31% developed new or worsening intraretinal and or subretinal fluid after a surgery. 10% had a worsening in best corrected visual acuity at six months after facomulsification. They, however, concluded that in real-world settings, cataract surgery was shown to improve the visual acuity in patients with wet AMD receiving intravitreal anti-VGF injections. Uh, and if a patient has fluid prior to cataract surgery, as long as they are actively being injected, uh, there is no difference in outcomes between those patients who had no fluid. And another study published also recently, last year, again retrospective, matched case control study, uh, mm, of course, uh, uh, analyzing outcomes after cataract surgery in patients uh, undergoing treatment for neovascular AMD. Visual acuity at uh, 12 months uh, was uh, better in FACO versus controls, and it was uh, statistically significant, with a mean visual acuity gain of more than 10 letters. Vision loss was more common in patients who underwent surgery within the first six months of anti-VGF therapy. Thus, 
the authors suggested that cataract extraction within six months of starting treatment for neovascular AMD should be avoided whenever possible. Another study uh, um, tried to answer if there was any difference between a standard FACO emulsification, conventional cataract surgery, and femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery uh, in, in, in uh, wet AMD. So, uh, they, they, and they analyzed central macular thickness, central macular volume, visual acuity, post operative number of anti VGF injections, and they found that post operative course between the wet AMD after femtosecond and conventional FACO cataract surgery was equal. There were no differences. Of course, there are also issues related with the uh, IOLs, uh, IOL selection in patients with AMD. Uh, AMD affects macular function, uh, deteriorates visual acuity and contrast sensitivity, so the quality of vision. Patients with AMD often need brighter light for reading. So, uh, we, we are quite aware about some problems related with multifocal IOLs. They split light rays into different focal points. They are associated with reduced contrast sensitivity, especially in the mesopic situations, and they produce more glare and light scatter. So, they might negatively impact on post-operative outcome. Other IOLs, like monofocal, toric, accommodating IOLs, they are not known to affect contrast sensitivity and they are suitable for AMD patients. Finally, aspheric IOLs, they could uh, improve contrast sensitivity, they have better glare sensitivity compared to spherical IOLs, so they might be beneficial in improving visual quality in AMD patients. So in conclusions, uh, recent evidence from population-based studies, cohort study, a systemic review, and meta-analysis did not find any uh, negative association between cataract surgery and dry AMD. Uh, no vascular AMD patients with visually significant cataracts may successfully undergo phacomusification without a visually significant worsening of the underlying neovascular process when exudation is controlled with anti-VGF therapy. Uh, I could also recommend some practice patterns regarding the surgery in the uh, AMD patient. So, based on this literature, cataract extraction within six months of starting treatment for neovascular AMD should be avoided. Uh, we could uh, uh, initiate topical steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops in the perioperative uh, period and reduce the anti-VGF treatment interval around cataract surgery and uh, <clears throat> inject anti-VGF one week to two weeks prior to cataract surgery in order to stabilize the choroidal neovascular membrane. And finally, an additional evaluation and or injection after cataract surgery beginning one month following the previous treatment uh, could be also uh, recommended. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I think that uh, you address quite important issues regarding, for example, the yellow lenses. And just the session be, be, before us, they also addressed a little bit the question whether we can implant yellow or blue blocking or blue filtering lenses in patients with AMD. I don't know. So you are not so much in favor of it or yes, or, or what would you say? I can hardly understand your yes, question because of the sound okay. here. So maybe I can. Come yeah, here. okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you can come and sit here, maybe. Yeah. You're right, we have also difficulties to follow. So my question is, the yellow uh, filtering lenses to implant or not to implant in patients, but of course you do not know whether the patients will develop an age-related macular, macular degeneration since we operate always earlier and earlier in life. Huh? Yeah, as I mentioned, I mean, there is no proof uh, that they bring any benefit. This is what I can say. Yeah. say yeah, uh, now, depending, and that is what the, in the previous session they didn't discuss, is that a yellow lens 
from one company is not the same than a yellow lens for another company because the biomaterial is different and the chromophore that they use is also different. So the, the, the sensitivity or the, the transmission of light in the, uh, in the blue blocking uh, 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 area of the light, of, of, the, of the visible light, is different from one lens to another. And of course, you have to see what you are speaking about. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it's, uh, for example, you have some lenses that are really yellow and other ones that are really a little bit only a little bit of yellowish uh, coloration. And I think that makes a big difference. So finally, as far as my uh, um, personal approach is, is um, uh, regarded, I mean, uh, I uh, use the technology, which I am sure I'm pretty convinced that it works. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I must be convinced. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. We're still missing the trial that compared different blue blocking lenses so that and really the evidence has come out that they weren't protective for progression of macular degeneration and there's still that sense some of them are beneficial from a contrast sensitivity point of view but uh, the evidence is unclear I like you intuitively feel that they're a better lens but the evidence doesn't back that up and each company will tell you their lens is the better chrome yeah, for yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a little bit the problem <laughs> okay so the uh, next speaker is Dr. Silvia Pini from Italy, and um, she will speak on the strategies of fixation in patients with macular degeneration. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for the opportunity of being here. I am here on behalf of Professor Midena from University of Padova. And these are my financial disclosures. In macular degeneration, photoreceptors are early affected both morphologically and functionally. As you can see from this OCT image where there is the absence of the line of photoreceptors and also a scotoma. With the progression of photoreceptor loss, uh, it may appear a macular scotoma and some fixation changes. The impact of central scotoma for this type of patients uh, is really um, terrible and there is loss of daily activities. Especially uh, it is really impaired the reading ability and a reading a text such as this Italian poem becomes a very difficult task for these patients. But fortunately human vision is a dynamic process that can adapt even to this hard situation of the presence of macular scotoma. Um, we have cortical adaption to the presence of scotoma and retinotopic reorganization of the visual cortex. For example, a mechanism through which the patient can improve his vision is the concept of perceptual filling in. For example, in late AMD, uh, where there is affection of both eyes, but as you can see in this case, uh, there is a scotoma of different sizes, even the worst eye can perceive the scotoma as smaller thanks to the better eye visual field. So this is the concept of reorganization and improvement and plasticity. So what are uh, the sequences of events uh, in foveal and macular degeneration? First of all, we have a foveal lesion with the uh, com comparison of fixation instability. Then we have the development of a macular scotoma and we have total migration of fixation that becomes completely eccentric. But this process is not the same in all maculopathies. For example, in diabetic macular edema, fixation remains central and stable uh, for a long time, and only when hard exudase deposits in the fovea, then we have instability of fixation. While in AMD, it's a different thing. Um, and especially, we recognize two patterns of changes of fixation. In wet EMD, for example, that represents an acute event for the macula, we have an early instability and changes of fixation, while in geographic atrophy that you can see in this uh, autofluorescence image, you have a stable fixation until end stages because there is foveal sparing. 
So this means that we can say uh, anything about fixation changes from the fundus of the patient and from the very beginning of a pathology. Like in this case, where macula was affected seriously by atrophic and fibrotic lesions, but still you can see that there is central and stable fixation thanks to fovea sparing. Um, reading ability strictly depends on fixation stability, so one may say that I can measure fixation by measuring the reading speed and the reading skills of the patient. But reading ability is drawn by several mechanisms, such as the memory of the patient, the knowledge of vocabulary, the ability of the patient to build a sentence. That means that this may be quite different in different patients. So even reading speed measurement is not enough to measure fixation changes in patients with macular degeneration. So visual acuity is not enough as fundus examination to say something about fixation. So how can I measure objectively fixation in these type of patients? The only way is to um, uh, simultaneously image the retina when the retina is fixating. And this is achieved by means of microperimetry, which is an exam that matches fundus image and computerized perimetry. And it is also called fundus perimetry because each point of fundus is um, related to its function. Microperimetry allows to measure sight and stability of fixation. And this is done in two manners, a qualitative one and a quantitative measurement. The qualitative measurements um, classifies fixation from central to eccentric and also from stable to unstable according to the presence of fixation points inside an area, a central area of two or four degrees. While uh, a quantitative evaluation is the evaluation of the bivariate contour ellipse area, which is the area that comprises 95% of fixation points. This is an elliptic area, and this type of measurement seems to be more accurate and more sensitive and reflects the lead sub shape of fixation in this patient. For example, we made a study comparing the qualitative and the quantitative evaluations in GA, geographic atrophy, and we saw that the qualitative evaluation of fixation didn't show any changes during follow-up, while the quantitative evaluation showed significant changes during follow-up of these patients, even if they were tiny. So BCEA evaluation seems to be more sensitive and accurate. Also, BCEA has been related to reading speed. Specifically, an increase of the area of BCEA was related to a reduction of reading speed. The enlargement of BCEA means more unstable fixation because the points of fixation are scattered in a larger area. Fixation may be also measured in static or dynamic way. Uh, static way is when you do a task of just fixating a target, while dynamic fixation is measured during microperimetry execution. And in AMD, it has been demonstrated that both measurements showed uh, an impairment of fixation, an instability of fixation, which was uh, greater than in the other maculopathies. So what do we exactly measure by means of microperimetry? We measure the presence of the PRL, which is the preferred retinal locus, which is the eccentric area of the retina where fixation is attempted in presence of a macular scotoma. A patient may adapt by having one PRL or maybe more than one PRL, as you can see in this fundus image. And this is driven by the task that the, that the patient has to do and also by the sensitivity of the retina around the scotoma. The choice of PRL by our brain is made in order to preserve binocular vision in corresponding retinal areas. And this is usually reading-driven process, which means that, for example, in left to right readers, the scotoma is usually placed to the right of fixation in order to avoid that the scotoma is projected onto the beginning of the text. And this improves the reading skills and reading um, speed. 
So all of these evaluations are very important to analyze the presence of PRL or more than one PRL and to analyze the shape, size and location of scotoma, but not just from a descriptive point of view, but uh, it is especially important and crucial for eventually plan rehabilitation programs that are very important for this type of patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions uh, to this talk? Uh, Maybe I can do even the next one, which is very correlated to this Great. one. Yeah. And then let's see. And then we have a discussion of both talks. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. So, visual rehabilitation in AMD patient. Um, financial disclosures. So I already mentioned cortical plasticity, which is the basis uh, for the patient to adapt to the presence of scotoma, but it is also the basis and what we use to rehabilitate the patient. It has been demonstrated in uh, imaging uh, of, the, of the brain studies uh, that there is a reactivation of certain areas of the visual cortex even after a foveal lesion when there is rehabilitation. So the patient, as we have already said, develops the presence of a PRL, which is this area of eccentric retina that is useful for new fixation. But in some cases, something goes wrong in this process and the PRL may be located onto an unfavorable retinal area, which means, for example, in the middle of the scotoma or in an area where there might be progression of the atrophic area or where retinal sensitivity is not the best for the new PRL. So here it comes, rehabilitation. We want to improve fixation by using rehabilitation. We can either train the already present PRL, uh, if this is fine, or we may decide to train a new PRL, the so-called TRL, trained retinal locus. In this case, we want to redirect fixation and stabilize fixation and have an improvement, of course, of daily life activities, but also of reading ability. How can we do rehabilitation once again by means of microperimetry? So microperimetry is very useful because it allows to quantify macular fixation retinal sensitivity exactly related to fundus characteristics. We can evaluate size and shape of scotoma, sensitivity also around the area of scotoma, which is very important to find a suitable retinal area for the fixation of the TRL. And we also can define, as we have already said, uh, the uh, stability and location of fixation points. This is obtained by means of an eye tracking, which is an infrared um, acquire of images that is continuous during the exam and can, uh, mm, let's say, it can compensate the eye movements and also um, the fixation targets that we project onto the retina. So here you can see some typical uh, scotomas measured by means of sensitivity and also uh, a design of the area of scotoma. Here you can see the sensitivity maps. And also it is important to know that microperimetry allows also the overlapping with several other types of images of the fundus, not only color fundus, but also fluorescence and geography, uh, or also autofluorescence. And this makes our evaluation, uh, for example, of the uh, area of possible progression of AMD or geographic atrophy, very accurate. These are some differential maps, not only of retinal sensitivity, but also of fixation location. And here you can see also different targets that microperimetry allows to use. Uh, for example, um, when we have different types of maculopathies and we need larger uh, targets to be fixated. We have several instruments to perform both microperimetry and rehabilitation. They all share these characteristics. And the applications, the current applications, are not just in AMD, but also in several other maculopathies, such as diabetic macular edema, but also myopic maculopathy or other degenerative maculopathies. 
In AMD, it is particularly important to quantify the impact of the scrotoma, but also the evaluation by means of microperimetry is important to optimize the timing for rehabilitation, select the correct patient, and uh, decide the treatment options. As we have already said, uh, late MD causes fixation instability and instability is terrible for reading skills. So rehabilitation program will improve reading ability and reading speed. Biofeedback rehabilitation is an effective method to rehabilitate the PRL or the TRL. How does it work? The operator selects the area to be uh, fixated by the patient. Uh, it may be the already present PRL or a new PRL and the patient has to fixate correctly. There is a biofeedback which is an acoustic sound that becomes more continuous when the patient is correctly fixating, while when the patient is far from the target, the sound becomes less continuous. So the biofeedback, the acoustic biofeedback, helps the patient to understand when he or she is doing right. When the patient is correctly fixating, we may also have a structured pattern that is projected onto the retina that we want to rehabilitate, and this helps to increase rehabilitation. A typical rehabilitation program uh, usually involves one eye, which is the better eye for bilateral cases, and we have eight to 10 sessions, 10 minutes each once a week with eventually different patterns. Here you can see an example of a patient with a geographic atrophy. You can see that before rehabilitation, we had a large area of um, fixation points, a large BCEA, and after rehabilitation, we have a smaller area, which means uh, a great um, result of, fixation, of rehabilitation and more fixation stability. This is another case, a bilateral case of geographic atrophy. The same thing, you see the scotoma centrally and the uh, scattered points of fixation, and the area becomes smaller after rehabilitation program. I'll show you also a case which is not AMD, but this is a pseudoviteliform maculopathy. So another application of rehabilitation, you can see the large area of fixation at the beginning due to the atrophy of photoreceptors in the macula in both eyes. And after the program of rehabilitation, you can see the very improvement of BCEA, which is smaller. And this is in both eyes. In maculopathies such as this, uh, it is easier to decide where to practice rehabilitation because the uh, degeneration is stable. So we are not afraid of um, rehabilitating an area that may uh, go you toward progression because here the situation is stable. Um, far distance was unmodified, but we could uh, note an improvement of reading skills, and this is what we want to obtain with rehabilitation. So it was a good program for this patient. So in conclusion, visual rehabilitation advantages are that we can reinforce the PRL or we can train a new TRL, obtaining a better fixation stability. And this improves especially the reading skills. And also we have to say that correctly rehabilitated patients are more able to use optical ads such as magnifying lenses, filters and prismatic lenses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should I come there with you? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes please. Uh, just, can I ask a quick, quick question? I, yeah. I really like that work on the PRL and the use of microperimetry, I think, is something that we don't do enough of in AMD work. And if if we're looking at the magnifying lenses that my husband is going to talk about and I'll talk about, do you think we should do a course of pre-surgery uh, rehabilitation to maximize the use of the intraocular magnifying lenses like you do for the handheld magnifiers? Uh, I think it could be a good idea, yes. And how long do you think we should give? Is that over two weeks, over two months? How long should we train them prior to doing the surgery? Two, um, two weeks, usually it's fine because, yeah. Two weeks will get that tightening of the PRL that you demonstrated. Yeah, there. yeah. for um, patients who cooperate, yes. How long does each rehabilitation session last? 
Um, How long do you have to work with them on these sessions? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah, only ten minutes. Only ten and patients usually are really happy because it doesn't take long and they see results quickly. Thank you. And uh, I would like to introduce the uh, next speaker, Professor Marie Jose Tassino, uh, our co chair um, from Belgium, who will speak about physics behind the magnifying IOLAS. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I will speak a little bit uh, in the same line than the previous speaker and a little bit anticipate the presentation of the next speaker because he will speak about uh, the latest uh, devices of the intraocular magnifying intraocular lenses. So indeed, well, we are dealing most of the time uh, in patients with patients who have uh, macular degeneration, whether they have wet or dry macular de degeneration. And of course, we have to define which are the best and the ideal patients in order to have an intraocular lens implanted, for example. We are more and we are certainly familiar with the external magnifying devices. Uh, you all know them. They are not so beautiful for the patients. They are also not very handy sometimes. Uh, sometimes you have, you need your both hands and you cannot because you have well, one hand is taking the magnifying spectacle or magnifying there and the other hand for typing, not very practical. The uh, handheld uh, Galilean and Kepler magnifying devices, you have to look and to read very close to the object before you can see them. So we know that they are uh, there, we know that they are very useful sometimes, but in some conditions and the patient must sit and fixate in the, in the same direction, but they cannot move and turn around too much with their head. And this is of course one of the big drawbacks of the external telescopes. They are removable and this is their advantage on the other hand, because if the patient is a little bit tired of using them, they can put it aside. The Galilean systems, they magnify approximately three times for far. They can magnify up to five times for near in mono and up to eight times for near in binocular. Their visual field is relatively small, five degrees or 11 degrees. In the Kepler, magnification is six to eight times for far, two to four times for near, and the visual field is uh, if for, uh, for near, and the visual field is a little bit larger 14 degrees. In the bioptic, Elipelli's uh, de um, uh, device, it's a magnification of 3.3 times for far, and there is a visual field of 14 degrees on 7 degrees. Just like the previous uh, speaker said, what we miss currently in patients who most of the time have both eyes affected is how they behave in binocularity. And here you see the patients, one eye, and sometimes fixating with the other eye, they lose, in fact, often also their um, dominancy. And the one eye that was dominant before the AMD or the atrophy, atrophic degeneration started becomes not dominant anymore, or sometimes they never lose their dominancy, even if that eye is very bad. This is a scanning laser of thermoscope uh, uh, imaging, which was very beautiful and very useful. Unfortunately, the, the manufacturing of this device stopped because of patents, a fight between Germany and between Belgium, uh, between France, sorry. Just like the previous speaker said, we use as well the micropyrimetry, the MP1, and I think this is a very useful uh, uh, device. It is a psychophysical test. It can assess the retinal sensitivity, fundus control, information on the size, depth, and location of the scotoma. You can follow the patients up over time, and you have, of course, a good information about the preferential retinal location. And I think, indeed, and I totally agree with the previous speaker that it is of utmost importance. You need, indeed, an, an, if you have an unstable fixation or an eccentric fixation, it's fine, but as, as, 
at least it must be stable. And this is absolutely important. A relatively unstable uh, fixation will give less good results for re-education re unless um, my, the, my colleague doesn't agree upon that. Now, it is difficult for the patient to try to mimic what happens when they are living with a scotoma. And it's also even difficult for us ophthalmologists to know what the patients, what is the perception of the patients when they have to read, for example, a book with a scotoma there. This is just a simulation, but it is, of course, it is already something to tell the, the family of the, of the patients who have scotomas what it is about. Read with such thing and then you will see that it is not easy, that easy at all. Now, what will happen when you use, for example, a mirror telescopic eye well? Well, that will increase three times, something like that, three times, sometimes more, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the text to be read. And this is, for example, when you have a scotoma, this is, for example, how the patient could, could treat. It is indeed a little bit more bigger, but the scotoma also will increase when you have uh, magnifying devices in front of your eyes. Now this is okay, but when you have only one eye that is affected, you can plus minus scope with it. Maybe, depending also on the, on the dominancy of both eyes, not so much work has been done on that, but to reconstruct mentally what happens there is not that easy for a patient. This is, of course, an image that everybody knows. And then you expect what you see. You do, you do, not, see, you do not need to see so many clues in order to recognize, OK, that's the Mona Lisa. But if it is an image that is completely unknown, it will take much more time for the patient before they will be capable to see it. And then we have to, or to recognize it. And then, of course, we have to consider also the binocular multiplexing uh, uh, behavior of the patient, which is, of course, a brain issue. What happens when the patients have both eyes, one eye magnified, the other eye not magnified? These are all the issues that are not solved yet and that still needs to be studied. There is uh, the in the lens telescope of Elipelli. This is an uh, this is a spectacle uh, device where you have magnification that is here at the lateral side of the spectacle. The patient can see laterally so that they can have a magnifying uh, image of what they would like to look at. But look very well at what Elipelis made here. This is an image, the patient look at this. This is again a simulation. And would like to see what is on that board there. What can you read there? And this is the magnified image of that, of this, of this um, information that the patient would like to read. And when you look at that image, then it is quite interesting. You have a decreasing contrast. First of all, it's magnified, sure, but you have a decreasing contrast and you have also a decrease in the, in the colors that comes through. These are saturated colors, red and white and black. But what happens when you have unsaturated colors to look at? It will be even worse. So I think that there is, and that's what I would like to stress, it is not only magnification, but it is also, can we keep the same contrast sensitivity by magnifying the images? And I think optically, most probably up till now, not, com not certainly not. So this is another image. This is a person, he did it himself, he is uh, working in, in Boston, and he took an image of, or, or somebody took an image of himself, and he reconstructed the image, magnifying three times. And here you see that the colors that are not saturated, which is, for example, the face, is magnified three times, but it's much more blurred than the saturated color, the white, for example. And then suddenly you see here that little black dot. This is a pen and you see that that black dot is magnified and it's because it is a saturated color. So quite 
Other aspects have to be considered when thinking about magnifying intraocular lenses. I will do a little bit of a history about those intraocular uh, miniature teles telescopes that have been developed and it is a very beautiful development um, that is mainly thanks to, uh, to uh, Dr. Lipschitz from Israel. This is the first generation of the implantable miniature telescope and they had some drawbacks. They were very narrow, they had very narrow visual field. Often in 30% the patient experienced endothelial cell loss. There was uh, retinal visibility was relatively poor for the ophthalmologist to follow up on these patients. And if, if they are not implanted bilaterally, which was not advised at that time, and certainly not with that device, they presented, of course, an isaconia. Problems were when the patients presented PCO because they are very sensitive to yak laser and if you hit the mirrors then you had a big problem. And sometimes also centration problems. These are the images that I received from a person who implanted them and it was from Milan Isak from um, uh, Czech Republic. Now, the magnification of these lenses in that time was 2.2 and uh, on, on 3, visual field 9.2 to 6.6 .6 and in focus at 15 centimeter. Then came and still are used the double intraocular lens systems, the IOL VIP lenses, biconcave lenses, minus six, 64 diopter in the capsular bag and a biconvex plus 53 diopter in the anterior chamber. And then you see that the combination of these two lenses will give you a magnification of 1.3 at distance. The visual field will be much larger, which is of course an advantage. And because of the, they are more demanding regarding the space in the anterior chamber, the myopes benefit better than the other ones. Not maybe not only because of the myopes, because the posterior part of the eye is also longer. But they can be fitted much easier because you have more, play, more place most of the time in the anterior chamber. The Lipschitz macular implants uh, is, uh, gives a magnification of 2.5 millimeter. It is very, it's much more tiny. You see that you have no black area there, so you, ha you will have a, uh, uh, the visual field will, will be less uh, re reduced. And it is now a visual field of 12.48 degrees. When you compare the magnification of the IMT, of the IOL VIP and of the LMI, you see that there is a big difference between the IMT and the IOL VIP, 25% magnifications, and uh, while the IMT and the LMI give a much bigger magnification of the image. That will also result in uh, differences in the visual field, but of course also due to the design of the intraocular lens, the IMT is surrounded by a black area, a black plate, so that means that the visual field will be relatively small. In the IWL VIP you have an increase of 25% only of the, of the text, so that is a relatively useful magnification but limited magnification and with the LMI there you have a, super a superposition of the central part that is magnified on the, back on the, the, uh, the background that is not magnified and so this is a learning curve as demands a learning curve for the patient as well. Monocular binocular implantation, the IMT is monocular implantation, the other eye uses the peripheral vision. The IOL VIP is a binocular implantation or can be implanted binocularly and the LMI can also be implanted in binocular uh, settings. I would also like to show you just another uh, uh, intraocular lens, which is the ORI lens, that will be implanted on top of the uh, uh, back in the lens. Why that? Because at that time, uh, Dr. Litschups and myself, we were thinking, because the back in the lens doesn't give you any uh, secondary cataract, it would be good to have an additional lens that can be positioned in the sulcus on top of an existing lens or for example in an eye that already has been operated and that has and that needed um, that has already had yak laser capsulotomy. 
For the Ori lens, you need a little bit of uh, incre increasing of the incision, still six millimeter, which was is a little bit comparable to the artisan lenses, for example. And this is the device. So you have to pay attention also how to grasp the lens in order not to break the haptics and of course also not to damage the central part and the mirror part of this of the lens. Uh, it this is the first time that I use this lens, so it's a little bit bulky, a little bit un, uh, a little bit uh, un, un, unusual to implant. But once that you have done it, then it is relatively straightforward. I have only performed two patients with this intraocular lens implantation, so I surely will not give you results regarding the uh, uh, clinical results in, of these intraocular lenses. But the beauty of it is that you can implant it and you can explant it relatively easily when the patients feel that it is not really the uh, solution that they would like to have. You just have to explant it. But that's something that there is a drawback on that, because if the patient know that it can be um, uh, explanted, they do their best in the beginning, and that was our impression. They do their very best in the beginning. They improve, and their quality of image and their possibilities of reading are is better. But then it takes, of course, for those patients, it takes an effort, and it takes an effort for the brain to adapt. And then often, only later on, they said, you know, it's tiring. And then the, it's most probably more prone to be to that a patient will ask to explant it because it is explantable. But still, very beautiful device and a very, very, uh, very, very beautiful piece of, of art regarding the intraocular lens device. So this is uh, my message. I would also like to acknowledge the co-workers. Tanya Kuckerberg is a psycho, is a, is a neuropsychologist, and she did the psychophysical tests in all those, pa those patients. We also developed an, a test in order to take into account a decreased in contrast sensitivity, so that a patient could see beforehand what would be the quality of the image and their magnification that they will have if they are exp if they are implanted with this lens. Ros Rosema is a physicist, Ro Laure Gobain is an engineer in optics, and Dr. Van der Velde works in fact in, in uh, Antwerp and in Boston, uh, Schepen's Eye uh, in uh, Harvard, and then uh, the Eli Pelli, that's for his ex uh, spectacles, and also together with Dr. Van der Velde, Isaac Lipschutz gave me the images of the uh, uh, first generation of the telescope and Mil in Milan um, uh, sorry, he helped me in in uh, in collaboration. Sorry, with the Ori lens and Milan Isaac gave me the images regarding the implantable telescope. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, I think that we will have a discussion. Yeah. Do, do, do you have any comments or questions? I yeah. hope just. Thank you very much. Fabulous talk as always. Um, look, the main issue is contrast sensitivity, yeah. isn't it? That's Any it. Any way we can get around that? <laughs> I'm not an engineer in optics. <laughs> no. You're talking physics. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's a physics at an ophthalmologist level. <laughs> No, no. It's. Uh, I, I think, no, I have no idea how to compensate for that. I think it is just well known. If you increase the, the size of the image, you will, recrease, you will decrease your contrast sensitivity. That's it. But um, how to cope with it? No, don't know. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll save one question for the big discussion at the end. Okay. <laughs> so the next speaker is Dr. David Keegan from Ireland. He will speak on the use of intraocular magnifying devices in stable AMD, please. Right. Um, Andre and colleague, thank you, and the SOE, thank you very much for the invite to talk uh, at the session and to obviously the discerning members of the audience who chose to come into this room instead of the others. And uh, hope you don't think you're lost. Um, we've heard a lot, there'll be a little bit of overlap on the previous talk, so bear with me. Um, on that, and these were disclosures significantly for this talk, 
a grant support from Vision Care and I'm running a phase one trial in the next generation of the intraocular magnifying telescope. You've seen some of these slides, these are from Anne Milam's collection. Really, the challenge for end stage age related macular degeneration, both the dry type and the wet type, is how do we rehabilitate these patients? And the fact that there are so many options available to us really highlights that we're not that effective. We live in the era of anti VEGF treatment. We're accurately and well treating early wet type macular degeneration, but we're not so good when it comes to this type of atrophic uh, disease. So this is a slide I produced for colleagues in the National Council for the Blind in Ireland to explain what we do for patients at various stages of vision loss. And we have 270,000 patients with a mild vision impairment in Ireland, down to 12,500 patients who are def defined legally blind. And you can see that at this area of moderate vision impairment, we've got surgical options, cataract surgery, macular hole surgery, macula on detachment surgery. But as patients have get more severe vision impairment, our surgical options constrict. And we're then down to low vision assistance with magnifiers and then social assistance, making sure that they can live independently through other means. So really the goal of the work that everybody on the panel here is looking to and all the companies involved is how patients with more severe, the upper end of moderate vision impairment, how we can achieve, or implement more surgical approaches to improve their quality of life. So this is really what we're using at the moment. And if we overlap the, those with limited visual disability, we're using just the standard aids here and more magnifiers then as things get worse and then the electronic optical aids. And then we're down to the low vision aids and the sort of technological era, iPhones, iPads and that. And then when they're fully blind, we really are into the software, the JAWS software and specially adapted uh, techniques. So we've got a range of options and Mario Jose has talked about some of these already and some are still with us, such as the IMT, the VIP, the RE lens, the IMAX Mono, the Shariath lens and the next generation. And some have been and gone and we're not really using the LMI anymore and the IOL AMD has really turned into the I IMAX Mono and we're not using the Fresnel Prism. So I'm gonna talk about a few of these and the fact that we have so many options I mean that not one option really supersedes the others. And is there a role for all of them in our practice? And how would we best decide on which ones to use for which patients? Uh, I touched on there with my question, Maria Jose, the key underlying issue is that balance between magnification and loss of contrast sensitivity. And that's the big issue for us in this field. And how do we get around that? So uh, one of the students worked with me a couple of years. You don't need to read this, but he actually did a nice piece of work on all the literature and what was available online about all these devices to do a comparison on what we have. So we really looked at some key devices. We looked at the IMT right through to the Shariath lens. We looked on who they're developed by. I had an indicative cost. These prices may have changed, but this is the indicative cost of these devices all converted into dollar price. The device mechanism, as we've heard from Mary Jose in, in her nice talk there about the physics, some are Galilean telescopes, the LMI and the RE lens are Cassegrain, that's the mirror type uh, technology, the use of Fresnel prism, and we'll look at those. And then there's a straight up in the Shariat lens, a plus 10 central magnification zone. We looked at trials and studies that are published on these patients and what's out there, the numbers of patients enrolled into these studies and whether they're case series, what level of magnification that each of the devices provide. It really ranges from 1.2 to 1.3 up to 2.7 for the IMT. And if that has any other impact, we looked at the study design of these and we really have a prospective open label multi-center clinical trial just fellow eye controls. We did not none of these trials have regular cataract surgery as controls. And I was listening to Andre's talk at the beginning there. And you look at that group from Mike Ober did in the US and then the Australian group. So you really have got to allow for a five to seven letter gain from cataract surgery in patients with wet macular degeneration versus those who don't have cataract surgery. We've got to bear that in mind when we're looking at these patients. We also got to look at the follow-up because there's an impact. Some of this is large incision sur surgery. What is the impact on the cornea and ocular comorbidity and how well these devices are tolerated by the patients long-term? Uh, Mary Jose has pointed out some of the patients request these to be removed. So really looking at the IMT and this has already been discussed, so I'm going to scoot past this and really looking at the surgical technique 
here, we'll just jump straight into the implantation of the device and I'll speed it up. So it's a large incision wound. We're back to our extra caps or cataract days. So that's comfortable for the mature surgeon, but for the modern surgeons use the cataract. But then we're implanting the device into the bag and then we dial in those PMMA haptics into the bag there. Into, and we a large number of sutures, so between six and seven sutures. And these patients need a peripheral iridectomy because they are at risk of development of pupil block. Okay. So these have gone on to the next generation of design. See, can we avoid that large wound? Can we do something to increase the anterior chamber depth post-operatively? And can we improve the rehabilitation? So the group in Vision Care then and L.A. Aroni who's here in the audience, has developed the injectable telescope. And with this, after phaco emulsification, we can now, with a, a large barrel, this is a 7.5 millimeter wound that we're using here. A little bit of a wiggle. I have these malaligned. They should be slightly rotated a bit more. And then we pop the Wang device. So the leading haptic is away from you underneath. That's into the bag, stabilizes the bag. And then the two following haptics that are more proximal to you then feed into the bag. So we've put in a, a nine of these and they've all discharged uh, quite nicely. And I haven't had, my, my breathing stops putting them in, but uh, it starts again soon after. So the RE lens, and again, Mary Jose has talked about this. This is a double mirror lens. So you've got the eccentric, so the sort of surrounding mirror that faces back out to you and receives the image. And then you've got a central mirror that's got its back to you that reflects the image back onto the macula. So it uses the curvature of these mirrors to create a magnification effect of about 2.2, 2.3. It's a thinner lens and you place the lens in the sulcus and the PMMA loop haptics. So I put in one of these lenses. I don't have a video. Uh, Mary Jose has already shown a video of that. And, your experience so they're a little bit fiddly to put in uh, i have snapped the haptics i don't know i know julie Silvestri in belfast has snapped them but i think a more pliable haptic and it's a nice technique to pop into the lens mary Hosey's already shown you that video so i won't go and show you that and with the iwell vip again it uses that prismatic effect so it's back to the earlier talks we talk about preferential uh, retinal loci and how do we best get an image onto that and what's nice about this is just a cartoon uh, animation of the device. I haven't put the IOL in myself, but it's a double lens technique and it has a two effects. It gets a magnification based on the distance between the two lenses, but then I'll just roll that back if I may. So there's a couple of issues here. So you're getting a magnification effect from the lenses, but also prismatic effect. These are slightly offset to focus the light on the eccentric bit of retina that's working better than the diseased retina there. So then the impact of that is, is seen in the follow-up piece where you see, if you look, you offset the scotoma so that you can read the text in that sense. In the IMAX Mono, it's a ge device generated by the group at the London Eye Clinic with uh, Bobby Koreshi and Scott Robbie. And really they've looked at refining the optics of the lens as best that they can with this material. This is the, 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 what they propose to do. And then it creates an enhanced image either centrally when you do it normally or in combination with another lens, you can eccentrically fixate that image and get a 1.3 magnification uh, with that. And the effect of that is shown somewhat here, again in this animation, I'm just waiting for these to be supplied into Ireland, but you two things, you can play, in regular cataract surgery, you can place the IMAX mono straight into the bag, and what that has, the, if, I'll show it coming on, or if somebody's already pseudophagic, you can place an IMAX mono in the sulcus here, so they're not yet on commercially available. I, I know the group in London have put a few of these in, but they're not available to us just yet. That may be different, I don't know if they're in, in the crowd, it may be different now. That was the case as of last October. But if you roll this forward then, and that's, that piece is to just indicate the wavefront technology that the, that the enhanced optics within that particular lens. And then the Shariath lens, last one, is a modified sulcus lens to go in. This is a really nice idea, and I don't have any experience of putting the Shariath lenses in myself, and I know it's something that Julie Sylvester, a colleague in Belfast, is commencing a trial and look at this. But I just put a central plus 10 diopter ad in. It's for monocular use. The IMAX Mono, the IOL VIP, can be binocularly used. 
The Shariat lens and the IMT and the Wang are for monocular use. And the Shariat lens, just show here, um, that's the lens itself. It's a square design, but and in a nice, it goes into uh, a regular injection cartridge there. And this is um, a nice video for, I got from YouTube from the group themselves, Dr. Gabor. So they inject into the sulcus. This is it going into the video, the animation obviously there, and it centers then quite nicely. So you've got a regular sort of a quick procedure to do that. So we looked at the data that's out there that's available currently, and this may have been updated, but this is what we were able to get our hands on. This looking at sur uh, surgical technique and size, so large wound uh, needed there for the IMT, uh, less of a wound, seven millimeters for the VIP, down to 2.2 millimeter incision for the Shariat lens itself. The rehabilitation is needed for the IMT and the Wang, and to a degree for the IOL VIP, it's not used for the other lenses. So looking at mean vision gain here, we're looking at the slightly different measurements here, but 3.47 letters with the IMT and 2.41 out to five years. There's a logmar improvement with the VIP, 1.47 up to 0.87, and then uh, the LMI at 3.66 with a small series. And then down, it's interesting, look at the IMAX Mono, 1.06 up to 0 .0, uh, 0 0.71. I'll show you some of that data in a second. And really looking here, we've got a few cases where they've shown the data, but the improvement in reading from J13 to J2.5 at one month. So it's a small number, but it gives an indication of what each of the devices can try and do. Uh, for, for quality of life, uh, it's just really in the IMT and the LMI this was measured. Endothelial cell loss, again, for the IMT device, it was about 25% at 12 months and out to 35% at five years. The other devices are in around 7% and the Wang device is 7.92%. Currently, the uh, IMT is the only FDA approved device, but all the other ones have a CE mark, which means that they're safe to use inside the eye. So this just looks some of the indicative data from the IMT trial and really the one showed 67% showed a three line improvement in best corrected distance acuity and 53% had a three line improvement in distance and near acuity. Really the complications really around the reduced endothelial cell count and adverse events as Mary Jose pointed out, device removal, inflammatory deposits and that would be my experience is the main issue is really post-operative inflammation is usually managed with drops. I haven't had to remove a device yet, uh, but it is possible that Mark Wilkins uh, sh shared a nice video on that. With the RE lens, the big issue I sort of found was the pupil size, that if you've got a small pupil, the lens doesn't work as well, you might need to stretch it out, and it's difficult to image the fundus, and you can't get a good OCT image, and I feel we need to be able to continue that follow-up with our patients afterwards. And what it does work, has worked to improve the visual acuity in, in the patient I've done and in Mary Jose's, it hasn't, uh, it's difficult to track these patients. And when I have uh, two patients with I, my IMT and one in the Wang who've had reactivation of their neovascular complex. In the IMAX Mono, is a case series, consecutive case series of 244 eyes published in the European Journal of Ophthalmology last week, implanted with the IMAX Mono. And there's no straight up cataract control, but none of the devices have that. And there's a reasonable mean letter gain on the distance acuity and with near acuity with this device. But this is this is impressive in the device. And endothelial cell loss about seven to uh, percent, sorry, seven point nine percent, is similar to the Wang device. We do need to be able to image the back of the eye. This is the patient who this is before their anti-VEGF treatment with stable anti-VEGF treatment, and this is imaging through one of the IMT devices after it's been inserted. So the lessons I've learned from this, and I think we've all learned, the people on the panel here, patient selection is critical. You've got a number of devices that you've got a, a well-motivated patient with bilateral stable disease that's fairly symmetrical, I feel, is the best, definitely in the IMT Wang and the monocular uh, intervention groups. They need to be motivated for the surgery and for the rehabilitation. I feel it's very important for them to have the support of the family and friends. There's a lot of visits to come to afterwards. And that's why I was just asking about pre-rehabilitation to identify that PRL it might be a nice other filter for some of these patients. And I, there's definitely one patient I've regretted operating on because they didn't quite have that follow-up. Uh, they are appropriate technologies. I think now is the time that we start bringing these into more widespread use that more patients get benefit from this. And uh, it's an effective low vision device. I think a better vision, maybe the IMAX mono and those patients with, with better vision with the lower magnification need, with poor vision, we might go to the telescopic devices such as the Wang or indeed the mirror lens 
we, I, I personally await further studies on the Chariot lens to make a determination, but it does look like there'll be a role for that as an add-on lens for patients with reading need. We need to be able to monitor the macula. I still think vision rehabilitation is a key addition that we should make to this. And we still, to my knowledge, have no really good answer for management of that reduced contrast sensitivity. And, and I'm, I'd be really interested to start bringing in PRL training into all these patients that I'm putting through now that we can better uh, identify those patients. And definitely one of the observations I would have made uh, through the trial and the other patients, that if a patient finds it difficult to fixate on your Snellen or ETDRS chart after the surgery, they, they struggle then from then on after, and if they can lock on fast. So I've had one patient uh, go from uh, 636 vision, which is uh, 2100, 2120, uh, up to 2030 vision, but she was always a good fixator. Uh, I'm indebted to many people I've worked with on these studies, uh, both in my own hospital and collaborators in different hospitals, and obviously the team of Vision Care who uh, I run the phase one trial with. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to point out a low vision conference we're hosting in Ireland next year, and we hope to be able to debate issues such as this uh, at the conference in the context of a range of a lot of other low vision interventions that we propose. But thank you for your, your attention. Thank you very much. So this is time for the discussion, and uh, uh, all papers are open for discussion. So please uh, ask questions if you have any. Yes, you can. Can I ask about this eccentric PRL? What's the best, the maximum visual equity we can obtain with that method, with perimetry, microperimetry? You mean after rehabilitation? Yeah. Well, it strictly depends on the maculopathy, of course. For example, I showed an example where you had, um, a tw oh, sorry, I say in Italian, it's 2 to 10, which means um, 20. Because you mentioned that it's only yeah. possible to obtain some lines from near visual equity. Yeah. It's impossible with distance. No, it's not equity. impossible, but many, very often we don't see improvements for far distance. Mm -hmm. So, it, but we, for near visual equity, it's like, is it possible to get at least like 1.2 of the Snellen from near vision, or it's rather like 6.0, like the biggest letters? What's like the uh, limits big, biggest letters but biggest. but the, for the patients it's um, a lot anyway sure. they they notice even the smallest changes so it's anyway it's enough for them I mean sometimes they see uh, I'm getting worse when rehabilitation becomes I mean you stop with rehabilitation then they lose little by little and you mm -hmm. have to start again and they notice it even if mm -hmm. maybe sure. measuring is just only a small change and what's the percentage of people who gain something due to this uh, rehabilitation? It's like you will say majority of them? The majority, just... absolutely. But the selection of the patient is crucial because some, some people, sometimes you, for example, you decide to train a TRL and they absolutely do, don't want to fixate with that TRL, so you have to stop. Mm -hmm. and uh, talk to the patient because sometimes it's useless. So. Uh, the majority when they are motivated, but there are some cases in which you have to change or stop. Uh, is it possible to do that rehabilitation without microperimetry, like without that specific uh, device? In my opinion, no. <laughs> All right. Or possible. there is any other device you can use to treat, to rehabilitate them? Microperimetry is the best. You have different instruments, but microperimetry I think it's necessary. All right, thank you. And I have just one general question about these uh, IOL, like VIP IOL and any other type of IOL for the uh, very decreased visual equity of the patient. Do you, wa do you wait any specific amount of time after the activation of uh, wet AMD, for example? But the license determines it's going to be stable, i.e. without yes. any injections and fluid-free for six months. All right. At least. Thank you so much.
Yeah, I think the questions are really relevant that you asked because it is the the more your your fixation is eccentric, the less visual acuity will be, and that's you have to follow it up uh, with time as well. And yes. we, nobody knows how long you have to wait and to follow it up. And sooner or later, even if you have implanted a magnifying intraocular lens, the patient will experience evolve uh, evolution of their maculopathy. And I think that then we benefit from explantable intraocular lenses because this will happen sooner or later, unfortunately. I think that for, uh, let us say, uh, if, if I would say I'm absolutely in, in, in the line like, uh, that, like you, your, your talk was, I would say implanting of a an, of an magnifying intraocular lens in stable cases, six months at least, dry, no reaction, plus a fixation pattern that is stable. And then I do not know what to do with the other eye, but something else. I, I agree. I, I'm more and more thinking we've got to use our microperimetry and that PRL mapping pre-implantation of these devices. And I think we, we've, we spend an awful lot of time talking about who the right patient is. And I think we can improve our selection and I think we can create more right patients by using that PRL yeah. pathway. And I think to answer the question, I'll disagree with you on one thing. I think there are other ways of doing it, but this is the best way of, it's the, it's the best way of doing it and knowing that they've done it for, for real. And as Mary Jose says, you, do not, you don't need great eccentricity off the center for a significant drop off in acuity. So a tightening up with the addition of a magnification. Now the lowest intervention is just to use a handheld magnifier or conventional aids. But uh, you, to consider then the introduction of an intraocular magnifying aid at that stage would be appropriate. And progression, there's nothing you can do about progression. None of us have a crystal ball. So you just got to make the best decision you can think you can make. Well, in fact, with the MI, M, MP1, the uh, observer who does the test knows where the patient fixates and whether the patient fixates correctly. And that is, that is unique. And I think that this is a big benefit. You absolutely see where the patient, where the, the cross is, and it's you as observer that puts the cross and the patient look at it, yes or no. And that's an internal... Uh, let's say uh, control that you you can you can see how quick the patient reacts as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So in fact, what happens when when a patient has uh, macular degeneration, and I can understand the, the psychology behind that, the patient loses central vision, tries to use all the different areas in the surroundings and with the rehabilitation of the MP1, you say as as uh, observer, you say use this here you, you you act more you use more often during the test you use it more often try to keep always that area and that's in fact uh, that's in fact the philosophy behind it yeah, yeah and, the, and the, one of the problems mentioned by professor tassignon is that uh, the data on the on the long term uh, let's say uh, follow up uh, on majority of these devices is rather poor yeah, I mean, uh, a few. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just uh, we know uh, yeah. only probably for IMP. Yeah. IMP. Yeah, but you know, when when you introduce uh, uh, applications for grant, <laughs> it's, it will never be chosen because it is a rare disease. It is uh, not interesting. Companies are not so much interested to to support it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's very difficult to get money. That's our challenge to make it more interesting for them. <laughs> we can't get, but it is interesting. We do. We have very little long-term data, and yeah. that is a concern. Yeah. And we have the IMT, and and in some respects, the IMT then is a victim of its own um, structure and how it was set up. Because we look at it and go, oh, look at the endothelial cell count loss. Well, the fact we, but we don't know what the others are. It's they're likely to be less, but we don't know. But it is also interesting to see that the mean vision gain at three point four seven lines at one year does slip to 2.47 lines at five years. And you go, okay, but we do know the natural history. We've got so much better information now with the natural history, particularly of geographic atrophy, that they are gonna go that way anyway. So we feel there is a benefit. And if you need to remove it, you can remove it, but it's, it's ugly surgery. I couldn't put it up there before nine o'clock in the evening. <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not, but it, it can be done. But it's great that we have these range of devices, but they're all struggling in around country. 
can I ask you a question? Sure. Why? Because I love that summation of the uh, cataract surgery and AMD. Because for so many years it was like we can't do it. What? Why avoid for six months after that? Surely, if you've got two anti-VEGF injections in, you can go and well, do. As I, as, as I mentioned, it comes from the study which was published last year, and they just noted this uh, relation that uh, there is an uh, um, uh, increased risk of, of uh, AMD progression when that is uh, within the six month period. And, and th 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 this is based on this study. This is a French study by Day and, uh, and collaborators. Progression or hemorrhage? Well, this was the progression. Uh, yeah. Do you wait? Do, does ever, do you wait six months? Sorry. For if you've got somebody diagnosed with macular degenerate with neovascular macular degeneration, and have a cataract, will you wait six months before you start? Huh. Do the sur cataract surgery? Huh. No, in fact, no. Bec yeah. Well, I th I think that anyway the well everything depends on your technique, of course, and you and you have to to be to be sure of your technique and have uh, very small uh, complications. It is for sure that once that you have capsule capsule rupture and you have prolapse of your vitreous, you are you are in danger most probably. But that's in between brackets because it's also not in hundred percent of the cases. But I would say yeah. You know, when the patient is is old, what are you going to do? To say no, I'm not going to 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 help you. What what is certainly the case is that they all say after surgery there is more light coming in, and they feel already a little bit better of that because of that. And I think that that's most of the time that's the the benefit. So in those patients, I want I wouldn't implant yellow chromophores, for example. Because what you want to do is to have as much light as possible that comes in the in the eye. That would be my attitude. Any other questions? I mean, uh, some data come from relatively big studies based on the big case series like this. Uh, I don't remember uh, how many patients they they, they analyze, but uh, mm, and then of course. Uh, we take into account it, I mean, and this, uh, in the reasonable way. Uh, so uh, I remember, for example, ECS, uh, ECRS endophthalmitis study shown that there was an increased risk of uh, silicon um, IOLs uh, and endophthalmitis. And yeah. finally, it did not really uh, interfere with the, with the common practice. I mean, people still implanted uh, silicon IOLs. Uh, even the ECRS study shown that the risk was five times more, more or less, I mean, uh, very similar to the intracameral antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And the same with the clear uh, um, cornea incision and the, and the scleral incision. Again, ECRA yeah, study shown that the scleral incision is much safer, five times less uh, than the clear cornea. But who uses uh, scleral incision today? <laughs> so, well. The same with temporal and superior incision. Any other questions uh, from the audience? So uh, thank you very much for being with us during this session. I would like to thank our speakers. Uh, I believe that this is a very important topic and, and uh, we still uh, search for the best solution for, for, for our patients. Obviously, it is very needed. Thank you very much for your attention.